Hi, my name is Brett Statham. Welcome to DevTest VMs in Azure. This is the first of four videos that cover DevOps scenarios with Azure and Visual Studio. And in this first video, we're going to look at creating DevTest virtual machines up in Azure. Now, I'll mention that you can get all the files of the slides and demos that I use through this and subsequent videos using the links on the screen. One of the things people assume about running virtual machines in Azure is that it's going to have to be a Windows operating system. And while Windows Server and client operating systems are certainly available, you're not limited to those. We also support SUSE, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, and OpenLogic distributions, as well as having pre-configured images that already have products installed, like SQL Server, SharePoint, Oracle, and Puppet. In fact, if you're an MSDN subscriber, we have virtual machine images pre-configured that already have Visual Studio installed on both Windows Server as well as Windows 8 client operating systems. And you can create those images a variety of ways. We've got a web-based management portal that even has a fantastic gallery of images and a wizard-based configuration tool. Or you can use scripting languages like PowerShell. So here, for example, this PowerShell script creates a new Azure Virtual Machine configuration, gives it a name and a size, and that's going to help drive its cost. We've got some code that's run ahead of time that's figured out the base image that we're going to use. We can even configure the administrative username and set up a load balanced HTTP endpoint that allows port 80 traffic to come into this virtual machine. We turn right back around and create a second virtual machine that's almost identical, except it has a different name, but it also joins in to that same load balanced endpoint. So now as traffic comes in, we can distribute the incoming port 80 traffic across both of those virtual machine instances. And then finally, a third virtual machine configuration that's going to be our SQL virtual machine and even has additional disks being attached to this VM that's going to store our database uh, data files and log files. Once we've got all those VMs config, then we can turn around and create a cloud service, which is the protective boundary around a collection of virtual machines. We tell it where that uh, cloud service should be and tell it to create itself and add those three virtual machines into it. So that's really cool, right? Being able to script things out like that. And then finally, we support a variety of automation tools. Built into the Azure Management Portal, we've got a feature called Azure Automation, but we also support third-party tools like Chef and Puppet for change and configuration management. And lastly, the virtual machine images that you create are portable. That means that you can actually take virtual machine images that you're already running, say in Hyper-V or VirtualBox or something on premises, and then you can actually use a tool to upload those virtual hard disk files up in a blob storage in an Azure data center. And then you can provision new virtual machines off of those virtual hard disks. You could then turn right back around and take the virtual hard disks that are running up in Azure, copy them down to on-premises, and run them in your own hypervisor. So let's take a look at creating dev test VMs up in Azure. In the overview video, I talked about a variety of ways to gain access to Microsoft Azure. One of the ways to do that is to simply go to azure.microsoft.com and then from there, click on the green free trial link and follow the steps to set up your free trial. Of course, if you're an MSDN subscriber, you can always just sign in to msdn.microsoft.com and under subscriptions, go to the My Account page and activate your Microsoft Azure benefit from there. We also talked about Visual Studio Online. Visual Studio Online is at visualstudio.com. And then you can, if you haven't already done so, just set up a free trial. Or if I go sign in, then from there I can, if I haven't already, create my account or access it from here. And then lastly, I mentioned that all the files are available. I've got the slides and demos up in a GitHub repository. You can get there simply from aka.ms, Azure Dev Ops VSO for Visual Studio Online. And that's the GitHub repo. And in there, I've got the deck as well as step-by-step -step instructions for each of the four scenario labs. So for example, this is the dev test demo. So inside there, I could simply open up uh, the HTML if I download it or the markdown if I'm here online. And I've got step-by-step -step instructions along with screenshots that walk you through the entire process. So feel free to follow through that on your own if you'd like. But back on the Microsoft Azure page, I'm gonna click up here in the top right corner for the portal and sign into the Azure management portal. Now, if needed, it would have prompted me for my credentials, but I've already signed in. And you can see uh, that I already have a variety of things configured up in my Azure DevOps Azure account. 
Uh, I've got a website. I've got a virtual machine. There's a cloud service that the virtual machine exists in. There's a storage account that's hosting the virtual hard disk for my virtual machine, et cetera. But up under virtual machines, here's the one VM that I already have running. And I could configure new virtual machines pretty easily. If I just come down to new, there's a variety of different compute workloads that are supported, but I want to create specifically a virtual machine. And you could do quick create, but I'm going to do from gallery. And this kicks off a nice little wizard-based virtual machine configuration tool. And you'll notice that we have a ton of images available that already have Windows Server uh, installed, as well as a variety of Microsoft products. But we also have a variety of uh, base images that already have Oracle products installed, as well as uh, for a number of Linux distributions as well. So certainly use any of those base images as you like. But I'm going to specifically turn on uh, this MSDN filter, and that's going to show me images that are specifically made available to MSDN subscribers. And you'll notice that I have some here that already have Visual Studio installed. So in fact, I want the Visual Studio Ultimate 2013 Update 2 running on Windows 8.1 Enterprise, the 64-bit version of that. So that's going to be the base image that I want to pick. And I'll simply go on to Next. Now, I'm provisioning a brand new Windows computer at this point. So Windows computers need a computer name. I'll call this my Azure Dev Ops Demo VM or something like that. Oh, and the name's too long. So how about just Azure Dev Ops Demo? And then I get a pick from a usage tier. There's basically two different tiers. Uh, what we've had all along in the past are standard uh, tier VMs. We now have this new usage tier called Basic, which is slightly less expensive than standard, but doesn't support load balancing and uh, virtual networking. I'm going to leave mine at standard. And then the next thing I need to pick is the size. Now, the size is going to range from an A0 up to A9. And it's really specifying how many cores and how much memory uh, this virtual machine is going to have available to it. But it's also going to affect the cost, right? Uh, lower resources, lower cost. Higher resources, higher cost. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to leave it at two cores and 3.5 gigs of RAM. You can always come back in and change this after the fact if you need to. So you want to pick one that's as low as you think you can go, but that is as high as is needed for the resources you think you require. And then the last thing I'm configuring on this page is the built-in administrator account, which in Windows would normally be called administrator. But since everybody knows that, it's a best practice to not name it that. And in fact, this wizard will prevent you from naming an administrator. You have to call it something else. So I'm going to call mine dev admin. And then I also have to make sure to give it a good complex password that isn't a common one. So I've got one that I like to use, but you, you, you would use your own here. And I set those in, it confirms they're valid. And then I go on to the next page in the wizard. So I mentioned this actually earlier, but virtual machines are wrapped up in this protective boundary called a cloud service. And the cloud service acts as a firewall as well as a load balancer in front of the virtual machines that are inside the same cloud service. The VMs that run in the same cloud service can see each other and have direct connectivity to each other, but they're protected from the outside world by this cloud service that surrounds them. The cloud service then is the public endpoint that people from the outside are going to hit. Uh, and so it gets an IP address, but we also get to give it a name. And you'll notice that it's usually gonna take on the name of the first virtual machine in the cloud service, and then have this .cloudapp.net domain name appended to it there. Now you can create custom domain names that point into this. I'm not gonna go through this in this demo, but you'll always have a cloudapp.net name uh, for your cloud service. Uh, you could also add it into another cloud service if you had one already in existence that you wanted this VM to quote unquote join, right? But I'm gonna create a new one. And then I get to pick the data center where I want this cloud service and virtual machines to exist. And you'll notice we have data centers around the world. I'm gonna pick West US because I'm out here in San Diego. And then you could choose the storage account where the blobs will be that make up the virtual hard disks or VHD files for this. And I'm going to let the wizard just pick one. It's going to use this randomly generated one that it already has created before. If you have a storage account that you specifically want to use, though, you would just pick it from that list. I'm not going to get into availability sets in this demo. And then lastly, I noticed that it's opening up two endpoints through that cloud service protective firewall. It's going to let me remote desktop in to this virtual machine using RDP. It's also going to let me use PowerShell to remotely administer uh, this using scripts. So I'm going to leave all that as is and go on to next.
And then on the last page of this wizard, it's asking me about the VM agent. The VM agent is basically a piece of software that allows us to extend uh, the functionality inside these virtual machines through things like uh, configuration tools for Puppet Chef, as well as custom script, as well as uh, malware and virus protection from companies like Microsoft, Symantec, and Trend Micro. I'm gonna leave that on so that this can be extended, uh, but I'm not gonna add any of the specific extensions at this point. I just hit the check mark button to finish up that wizard. So at this point, it's out there configuring this virtual machine or provisioning it. It's copying across the base virtual hard disk image. It's you know allocating the resources on a physical server somewhere, spinning up this virtual machine, creating the cloud service and the firewall rules and, and all that kind of stuff and getting this going. And so you'll notice that this actually takes a fair amount of time. It'll probably take somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes uh, before this virtual machine gets uh, created and has its status at running. So I'm going to go ahead and just pause the video at this point until that completes. All right, well, as luck would have it, that took longer than normal to finally get to a running state. But you can now see that I've got this Azure DevOps demo virtual machine at the running status. And when you're in the Azure management portal on the virtual machines page, if you actually click on the name of a virtual machine, and this is true for websites and the other pages as well, it brings you into the dashboard for that item. And I'm, I'm not really gonna go through the dashboard a whole lot because we're not gonna do much more configuration with this, but you can step through the various pages, uh, monitor the configuration, manage your endpoints, do further configuration, et cetera, with those guys uh, from that page. Uh, back on the virtual machines page, though, if you just click on the status of a virtual machine rather than its name, it's a way of sort of selecting that VM. And then down along the bottom, you'll notice that you have various things that you can do uh, with the selected item. And in this case, I want to connect uh, to that Azure DevOps demo virtual machine we just created. Now, remember that when I created it, there was a remote desktop endpoint that got opened up in the cloud service. And so this connect is actually going to download an RDP file and then hook me up to it uh, using remote desktop. So I'll hit connect. It tells me that it's going to download an RDP file. I'll say OK. And then I actually want to save that out into my uh, downloaded files uh, directory here. So I'll open up the folder. Here's my downloads directory. And inside there's this RDP. Now, you don't have to save it. You could just open it. But by saving it, you can actually come in and edit it and, you know, manage the, the, the resolution or what resources are attached or other things like that. Uh, and then finally, when you hit connect, it'll connect up to it. Uh, it doesn't recognize the publisher of this RDP file at first. That's okay. If you want to turn on the box, ask me again, you can. I'm going to just say. And now I need to log in. And so it's asking me who I want to connect as. Remember, when we provisioned the virtual machine, uh, we gave it a built-in administrator name of dev admin. But I have to prefix that name uh, with the Windows computer name for these Windows 8.1 uh, computers here. So uh, remember, I called it Azure Dev ops demo so that was the computer name and then backslash the username was dev admin that was the name that i provisioned for the built-in administrator account and then that complex password uh, that i specified and i just made a typo type it in correctly and go ahead and say okay and then i'm going to get one last verification uh, basically saying it doesn't recognize the certificate i'm going to tell it not to ask me again and just say yes and so at this point, I'm actually remoted in uh, to this virtual machine running up in Azure uh, from my workstation. And there I am. Now, in fact, you'll notice that there's a little bit of information about the virtual machine shown for me on the wallpaper. Uh, and that's because if you remember at the end of that configuration wizard for the virtual machine, there was that VM agent checkmark that was turned on. And by default, it actually enables two separate plugins. There's a, a password reset one, and then one that uh, runs BG info, which is a sys internal tools that writes some uh, computer information on your uh, background or on your wallpaper for you. So that's where that information came from. Uh, but there it is. Now, at this point, I'm logged in as the built-in administrator account. You could actually just continue that way if you wanted to. Uh, there's a few issues with that, though. First of all, it's not a best practice. You shouldn't be running as the built-in admin. Uh, secondly, uh, the built-in administrator can't do store app deployment on the local machine. So that means if you wanted to do Windows 8.1 app development inside this VM, uh, you couldn't actually debug it because it would try to sideload the app and then it would fail at that point. So in fact, if I jump back over to the instructions in GitHub, uh, you'll notice 
uh, let me just come down here. We've completed the first uh, one, which was creating the VM. In this next one, we look at configuring security. Uh, and you've got a couple of choices here. You could log in to this VM uh, as the built-in administrator account. But again, it's a best practice that you actually log in as a second user account that can also be administrative, but who maybe is not the built-in administrator. Uh, because as I said, the built-in admin can't do store app deployments. If you tried inside Visual Studio, you'd get an error like this, basically saying that it couldn't activate the store app. So I've got a couple of choices. Again, I could use a, a regular user account uh, that maybe I just also make an admin, but then I don't get all the great Microsoft account benefits like OneDrive integration, et cetera. So if you wanna use a Microsoft account, you again have to make a choice and that's do you directly add the Microsoft account or do you have a local account that you then associate with a Microsoft account. And it turns out that that option is actually the easiest. If you try to do Azure, or sorry, a Microsoft account directly, you actually have to change the authentication protocols, which requires you to edit the RDP file settings, and it's a little bit more of a pain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump back over to that VM that I just created, and I'm gonna go to the settings for that VM, and I'm gonna change my PC settings. And then under accounts, I'm going to create under other accounts, a new account. I'm going to add an account. I'm going to call it, uh, or actually down here, I'm going to sign in without a Microsoft account and then verify that I do in fact want a local account. And now I can give it a name. I'll just call it dev user. I'll give it again, a good complex password. And then you're supposed to put in some hint. I'll give it a great hint there and go on to next. And uh, I'm not gonna make it a child account. I'll finish that up. And then I'm gonna immediately go right back into that, edit it, and make sure that it also has administrator privileges. All right, so now I've got that. And now I can go on this VM uh, back to the home page, And I'm gonna actually sign out. And that's gonna break that remote desktop connection uh, to that VM for me. So then I can go back to the management portal or actually, remember I've already downloaded the RDP file. I can just go ahead and reconnect. But this time I again want to log in as another account. It's going to be the Azure Dev Ops Demo Dev User that I just created. Type in the password correctly. Yep. Having password typing problems. All right, and now that I'm logged in as that secondary account, I can again go into settings for the machine and change PC settings. And back under accounts, I'm logged in as that dev user account. And what I wanna do is connect it up to the Microsoft account that I actually wanna use. And so I'm gonna use this Azure, oops, sorry, I've gotta confirm the local password. And I have an Azure Dev Ops at Outlook.com account that I'd like to use that has its own password. And I need to verify uh, the last four digits of the mobile number that was used for that. And I should now on my cell phone, and there it is, have received a text with the code in it. All right, that helps me validate that account. And it lets me know that uh, now I'm, I'm synced in, I'm gonna start using OneDrive for my storage, et cetera, and uh, that it's gonna switch that account over. I hit switch, that may take a few minutes. All right, let me remove that wizardy tip there, letting me know the start menu's down there. Sounds good. And so now I'm going to do one last sign out and back in. So I can go back to the start screen. I'm going to sign out. And then one last time connect via RDP. And again, use another account, but this time it's going to be that Azure DevOps at Outlook.com with its password. And if all went well, I should get connected. And I'm in. 
Fantastic. So now I'm logged in as a Microsoft account that is a local administrator, but isn't the built-in administrator. I can do Windows 8.1, Azure, Web, WPF, whatever development. The only limitation is that I can't do Windows Phone development, uh, and that's because I can't connect a phone directly to the VM via USB because it's running up in Azure, and I also can't run the Windows Phone emulators inside a, an Azure virtual machine, at least not at this point in time. So, but otherwise, I'm set up and I'm ready to go. Uh, because I used the MSDN image that already had Visual Studio installed, I've also already got Visual Studio ready to go. So I can just launch it. And then I wanna sign in so I can sync this up to my Visual Studio profile using my Microsoft account. All right, and I'm signed in and ready to start using Visual Studio up here. Now, one of the ways that I like to use this is that I have a, an RT device, right? So I have Windows running on an RT device, uh, and because it's RT, I'm running Windows RT, and I can't install a full version of Visual Studio on that. So I'll take my Surface RT out to places with me because I get a longer battery life on it. I can connect up to the Wi-Fi at a restaurant or a coffee shop, and then I can actually remote into this dev test VM and actually do development uh, from my RT device. That's pretty awesome. So now uh, if I actually return back to the demo there, sort of the next step in this process after we configure the security and we've walked through all of those steps uh, would be uh, to start setting up any additional software, et cetera, right? So we're signed into Visual Studio, we're to go, good to go. Uh, and so now what I might, might wanna start doing is installing any additional software, right? This could be, uh, for example, the Azure SDK, any extensions to Visual Studio, maybe a database engine if need be. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and jump back over to my VM. Uh, and one of the first things I'm going to do is go and install the Azure SDK. So I'll close out Visual Studio here, pull up in my browser. And if I just go to, I'll use the recommended settings. Oh, in fact, real quick here, notice at the bottom here, it's uh, telling me that I have some add-ons that are ready for use. And this is actually important for uh, some of the subsequent demos here, specifically load testing. But I'm going to go into choose add-ons. And I want to make sure to enable uh, the web test recorder uh, uh, helper and the web test recorder itself, uh, because we're going to use that later on when we do uh, load testing. So I'll go ahead and enable them now just to make sure that they're there and I'm good to go. All right. Uh, and so again, back on track, we're look, talking about installing the Azure SDK. So I'll just go to azure.microsoft.com. And then from the downloads page, I want the VS 2013 install of the SDK. What that's actually going to do is run, uh, I'll run it here, uh, Web Platform Installer. So I'll confirm that. And just hit Install and Accept. All right, and when done, uh, it wants to just pull the browser up to tell me a little more about the SDK. I'll hit Continue. And then you can just read through that on your own and finish. And I'm good there. Now, some other things you might want to think about installing, uh, Windows Azure PowerShell. Uh, so we've got that. Uh, the cross-platform command line tools uh, lets you manage your Azure subscriptions uh, and resources uh, uh, across platforms uh, through Node.js. Uh, some other cool tools out there that you can install. I'm not going to mess with those right now. Hit Just hit exit. Uh, and if I go launch Visual Studio again, the next thing I'm going to want to do is install any important extensions and updates. Uh, so from the tools menu, I'm going to go to extensions and updates. And uh, I specifically am going to come down to online and I want to make sure that I install the application insights uh, tools for Visual Studio. So here it is right there, Application Insights Tools for Visual Studio. And that's going to let me work with Visual Studio Online's Application Insights right from within my projects. So I'll download that and install it. And once that's done, you'll notice that it's telling me that I have to restart. Uh, I see a green check mark letting me know it's installed. I'll hit reset, restart now. And it restarts Visual Studio and lets me know that it's been installed.
All right. Awesome. So the last thing would be to jump right back up into uh, extensions and updates. And under the updates node, start installing any of the updates uh, that are available. Again, you might want to skip uh, the Windows Phone 8 one in emulators, though, only because you're not going to be able to use the emulator from within uh, this Azure VM right now. So no, no reason taking up the space or the time to install those. But otherwise, go through and install all the other ones and follow the prompts as needed. All right, so I can now use this guy to do development. If I'm done, let's say that I'm using this thing for the day and I'm done for the day, while this VM is running, you're incurring compute costs for that virtual machine. Uh, and so if you're just temporarily done, but you, you know you're not going to be using it for the next 10 hours or so and or 12 hours or whatever, uh, and you don't need it running while you're not using it, then you might want to come down. So I'm going to go ahead and just disconnect. I'll hit the close uh, button up here to disconnect from the RDP session. Uh, and back over in the Azure Management Portal, I see that it's running, but I can actually select that and come in and hit Shut Down. I'll confirm that, yes, I actually want to shut it down. And by the way, while that's doing it, I'll jump back over here to the demo and just show you that these steps uh, are fully described uh, down here in the demo as well. If I scroll down, I talk about various ways of shutting down or deleting your virtual machine. So right now, uh, while it's shutting down, uh, or once it is shut down, notice that it says stopped and deallocated. And that deallocated is important. What it's letting you know is that any of the resources, any of the compute resources for that virtual machine have been released and you're no longer being billed compute costs uh, for that virtual machine. Now it does still have storage, right? If I go into the VM and on its dashboard, I can scroll down and see that it does have a disk that's living out in that Portal VHD's uh, storage account. And if I go into that storage account, try that again. There it is. I can jump into the containers for the blob storage. I'll see a VHD's one. And then inside there, I actually see a, a number of files, but we had this uh, DevOps demo and there's the VHD for it, right? So that's actually being stored out there. We, we do still incur storage a cost. Uh, storage cost, pardon me, for that virtual hard disk. But we're, at least because we've stopped that VM, uh, we're no longer incurring any compute costs. All right, so I can now leave it stopped. I could come back tomorrow or 10 days later or two weeks later, whatever, and simply start it back up. And then I can continue working with that virtual machine. Make sure that you stop it, though, from the portal. Don't just do a shutdown within the OS because the portal isn't aware, though, or then that you're not going to come back and just start it right back up. Uh, so make sure that you stop it from the portal so that it deallocates the resources for you. Uh, I say the portal. Uh, you could also shut it down through the Azure Management APIs, uh, but make sure that you're shutting it through the Azure infrastructure, not just from within the VM itself. Okay. Uh, the other thing is you might decide, you know what, I'm totally done with this VM. I'm never going to use it again. So at that point, you could delete it and you get a choice. Do you want to get rid of the attached disks, those VHDs, in which case you no longer paying for anything related to that VM. Or you might decide that you want to keep the disks so that you could either use them in another VM or download them and then delete them or something like that. Just remember, if you keep them, you're still being uh, charged storage costs for it. The other thing, though, is remember when we created this virtual machine, it got wrapped up in a cloud service. And so there's a cloud service out here uh, that shows that it's stopped right now. Uh, and it only has one VM in it right now, but it could have had multiple VMs. And what if you were done with the whole thing? You said all of those VMs that were associated with each other were totally done with it. So in that case, you could choose to just delete the cloud service and everything in it. If you delete the cloud service and its deployments, and that's the one I'm actually going to do here, I'll get prompted uh, letting me know that it's going to delete that and that it's going to delete all the VMs and all the disks in it, et cetera. Am I sure I really want to do that? And uh, because I'm going to turn around and use this later on, I'd say no. But if you said yes, it would delete the cloud service, all the VMs, all the VHDs, everything, and you're good to go. And then lastly, I can go back to the VM that I had. I can tell it to start back up. And it'll boot it up, take a little bit of time, but that VM will be ready for use again. All right. Well, hopefully that's given you a good idea of how you can create virtual machines in Azure and use them to extend your dev test workloads. I've got a few go-dos for you. Remember that there's other scenarios and I've got videos for each of those around continuous deployment, mo application monitoring, as well as load testing. So make sure to check those out. Also, if you're a startup, make sure to sign up for BizSpark or contact me directly and I can help you get an enrollment code to expedite the process. 
Make sure to get an Azure account either by signing up for a free trial or if you're an MSDN subscriber, go activate that Azure benefit and then sign up at visualstudio.com for a free Visual Studio online account. Here's a ton of links. I'm not going to talk through these, but again, you can download the slides and all these links will be in there. So feel free to follow up on these various resources. And as I said, remember that there's other videos out there around these other scenarios. So make sure to follow up and watch those. And I hope to see you there.